Hello, welcome from the European Cancer Congress 2015 in Vienna. Once again, immunotherapy was a hot topic. It was presented in several highlighted sessions. Uh, immuno-oncology is present in almost uh, every tumor entity. Now we have two experts discussing the recent advances in lung cancer. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Solange Peters from the University Hospital in Lausanne and Dr. Georg Pall from the Medical University of Innsbruck. What were your highlights? Well, covering, we will we'll discuss together because uh, it's important to find also a consensus in Europe now regarding immunotherapy because more and more I think we have to share the long-term follow-up of the activity of these drugs in our cancer patients. And uh, we have been exposed, I think, at this conference mainly to updates of what we were thinking or what we did know since, uh, since uh, the last big meetings, ASCO this year, for example. And uh, it has become very important for us to see if the expected benefit is still remaining and still true. So I, I think it will now reach the guidelines, and I can say it will reach the ESMO guidelines this year. And uh, we should find a consensus about who and how to treat your, our patients. So I can maybe ask my colleague what is his standard of care now and after ECC? Uh, to treat non-small cell and cancer patients with immunotherapy? Well, I uh, definitely agree with you, and I also agree with Rolf Stahel, who yesterday in, in his discussion said that the checkpoint inhibitor uh, agents uh, in the treatment of lung cancer have arrived in our clinical reality. So this is not uh, anymore uh, only science, but this is daily practice. So from my point of view, we are quite clear uh, as far as uh, the squamous uh, histology is concerned. We have the data from Checkmate 017, and they are quite clear. So I think nivolumab can be regarded as a new standard of care in the second-line treatment for these patients. I think we are closing the data gaps. We now have data regarding quality of life, which is important, and they also favor in, are in favor of the uh, nivolumab therapy. I think the only questions there are uh, what, what about the populations with the PS2 performance status, and maybe also the question about the elderly patients, because we have not very much data on patients uh, who are older than 75. This proportion of patients was quite low in Checkmate 017. I wonder what's your opinion maybe on that. For the screamer, yes, I fully agree that it's really the new standard of care, and uh, importantly, what I liked in the data presented by Martin Reck is to show that if you follow up the patient through benefit, through response to uh, nivolumab uh, long term, even if this kind of course of interpretation or data are subject, some, somehow subjective, the patients were reporting to almost reach back a situation where the quality of life and their ability to do things was normal or comparable to the normal population, the general population, which looks like very impressive for oncology because usually we, are always, we have always been very toxic in treating our patients. So this is really promising because we hope with immunotherapy, what I like also with this squamous trial is a plateau is to see that you have this reproducible plateau. Uh, it was presented at the word long for the squamous and, and here for the non-squamous. But you have this plateau for squamous, which is between 20 and 25% of the patient who will benefit long term. So the quality of the benefit is very important. And this I found very, very nice. So, uh, and the PS2, I would say, we didn't see at this meeting so much update, but I had the opportunity to discuss at the world long the phase three, four, I would say, um, yes. real life trial. Even if, despite, I would say, the fact that the follow up was short, it did include PS2, a significant number of PS2, who did not present with more toxicities than the other one. So, I'm quite confident, even if I agree it's not evidence based, like it, but I'm quite confident to treat somebody who is at the limit limit of PS2 and you, would you exclude these patients from, from the second line treatment? No, not really. I agree with you. I've also seen these data that were presented at Denver, and I think these are confirming what, what we probably, all, what probably all of us think in a way that these uh, agents are less toxic than chemotherapy and are probably even maybe easier to administer to patients with performance status oh, yes. too. So I think the other thing if we talk about daily practice is um, the non-squamous population. We have seen the update on the Checkmate 057 trial. So 
I think we're struggling with the problem right now, whom to give mm -hmm. the immunotherapy in the second line, or if there is any subpopulation who maybe is benefiting more from docetaxel or some kind of docetaxel combinations. I think this question is somewhat open and leads, of course, to the question of the biomarker issue. What we could learn here, one of the very important, I would say, argument is to see this long-term 18 months of our survival in the nivolumab trial showing an impressive 38 percent uh, survivors at that time point which I think has never been described previously so at least we know that the drug has a role in non-squamous. The main problem is to know that in patients without expression of this PDL1 biomarker, we can discuss further on the PDL1 biomarker later on, it looks like both drugs basically are equivalent. So there's no significant difference. They are, quite, they are quite equivalent in terms of activity. Same thing with the Roche compound as the atezolizumab. We had an ad, that update here of the Poplar trial, which is using atezolizumab, showing the same things, that the, there's no really a benefit of immuno-oncology agency without expression of PDL1, but a kind of an equivalence. So the question is, not only due to the cost, because the cost will be a problem, but also due to the fact that we like to really customize our treatment. What do you take as a take-home message in this? What would you do with your, you will have access very soon to pd one testing. Some companies give the technique available for the centers. So imagine you have it in your lab now. Do you use it? So I agree with you that there are no major differences between the PDL1 and PDL1 PD positive and negative subpopulations according to overall survival. But I'm a little bit worried when I look at the progression free survival curves in the PDL1 uh, negative populations. Uh, this seems to be there is, in, at least in the beginning of the, of the therapy, a quite a steep decline in the PFS curves um, for nivolumabs. No, I know that probably PFS is not the best and optimal endpoint uh, for immunotherapeutics and checkpoint inhibitors, but nevertheless, um, this is something which makes me a little bit worry and 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 have a look and and probably I will try if I have the possibility to use validated antibodies uh, in my lab, um, probably in the non-squamous population in the future, I will do that and, and use it as an additional factor to make my decision. Because there are other factors, I don't know what's your opinion about it, quite easy factors like clinical factors, smoking status, EGFR mutation status, ELK status, which also seem to be of importance for this uh, decision. It's, uh, it's kind of, um, the PFS is interesting, you describe it very well, because this PFS curve do cross each other. So it means that very early when you give nivolumab to this patient population, there is a certain number of patients who do not extract any benefit and progress. So it's, it's non-squamous, so it's a very heterogeneous population of patients. You have EGFR mutation, you have ALK rearrangement, and you have 20% of no, never smokers. So I would guess that the, the ones who fall down the cliff are the never smokers, but it's just a guess. And the problem is you should not base science on your guess. So like you say, potentially the never smoker population should be looked at at a separate subset of patients in terms of making treatment decisions. And it has been shown by, by the US colleagues showing that the number of mutation, what we call the mutation load, is probably a better prognostic, bio, predictive biomarker, sorry, than PDL1. It's not to be done in the routine practice, it's too expensive and too difficult, but the never smokers we know have really less mutations than the smokers. So this might be a selection criteria. I think what, what was quite interesting here is also the fact that we were uh, presented with data regarding a large number of possible future additional biomarkers. Uh, I think we have seen some early data on interferon gamma expression, and there are some interferon gamma ex uh, gene expression signatures around, um, which seem at least interesting or promising. There have been, I think, also very interesting early data regarding PDL1, ex uh, PDL2 expression as maybe an additional biomarker and maybe also an instrument which can help us to divide between the anti-PD-1 and the anti-PDL-1 agent. So maybe there's a difference and maybe we can use the PDL-2 biomarker um, 
to to get further into this into this field so i think many options and this is a field which will evolve during the next months and years our time is almost over and we have come to an end do you want to add a final conclusion well, I think the final conclusion is that our life of medical oncologists in the field of lung cancer has changed because now we have a new treatment option that we have to refine over time. We will get to know more about the biomarker and the patient selection, but we are at the very early beginning, so at the time being we have to be rational. We have data for our patients and a new treatment option, and we will refine the way we give it first line, second line, third line in combination or not in the next three years to come, I think. So from my point of view, there's not very much to add. I think exciting times and stay tuned.